This is the second part in um, in a two part series where where we've looked at educational research um, using the using the overall framework that uh, the people use in, for evidence based practice. Most of you are probably familiar with the user's guides to the medical literature and um, and the way that uh, that uh, we we use that framework to judge whether or not research is good in that case and whether or not clinical research is good and um and the and the overall framework is you ask of a study is it valid and that's what we did last time so a month ago and that uh and that presentation is available it's available to you on the on the on the on the website archive um today we're going to talk about how you take an education research study and look at the results and in clinical research, we're used to talking about numbers needed to treat and, um, and likelihood ratios and, uh, and things along those lines. And, um, and for education research, it's a bit different. And so what I'm going to do today is highlight the differences in the, and specifically talk about effect sizes and why those have certain advantages. So, uh, so as I mentioned, health education research has different study designs and um, different threats to validity. That's what we did the last time, and different metrics. And so, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So, what are the results of an education research study? And um, oftentimes, these are tests, and um, and so that we do we do an outcome test measuring knowledge or a skill. And, um, and do that on a post-test of some kind, and then report that in terms of scores. And, um, and, and typically, you know, sort of recreate the test, or we may validate the test, but, um, but the gist of it is, is that we come up with a unique outcomes instrument, which has relevance to us. We know what's in it, and we know what, um, what, what we're measuring with the raw scores on that outcomes instrument. But it makes it difficult to generalize to other people. So that um, so that uh, so they we know what's in our outcomes instrument, but um, but when you publish it, what the seven out of ten on my test means may be different compared to what it means um, to to someone else. And so uh, so in education research, we borrow a, a systematic review type of um, type of technology called effect sizes to be able to make apples to apples comparisons. So that Martin, are, uh, sorry, so that, yeah. can I interrupt, Martin? Sure. There's, there's some people who are having difficulty hearing. Are you able to turn your microphone up? Okay, let me see. Sorry about that. Is this better when I hold it directly in front of my face, under my nose? People are still having, it says people are still saying no. Okay. This is Mark. If you go to the top corner there where it says where the microphone is and you click adjust microphone volume, you'll be able to, to uh, increase it. Or not top corner, top middle where there's that green mic. Hello, testing one, two, three. That sounds better, Martin. Thank you. Yeah, okay, good. Um, okay, to just to then I'll just go back a couple of slides and just sort of quickly go through that. And um, with the with again the idea that we're gonna use this framework, we're gonna we talked last week about whether or not an education study is valid and what you need to look for that's specific to educational research from, from that standpoint. And today we're gonna talk about what the results are and how we can express those results in education research. And so it's a different metric than we would use in a, in a clinical trial, and I'm going to try and justify why we do that. Okay. And so, that, uh, so outcome measures are typically reported in, uh, that we think of them in raw scores. If we design some sort of exam or some sort of a, sort of, um, a skills assessment and we make it out of 10, then we know what that means. You've got 7 out of 10, that's better than 5 out of 10. But is it way better and how much better and, and that kind of thing. And, it, and does my test of 7 out of 10, um, how does that compare to somebody else who repeats the trial but with a different outcome measure? And that's where this technology from, from systematic reviews 
the idea of an effect size um, can help us in, in education trials. So an effect size is really quite simple. It's, um, it, takes the, uh, it takes two comparison groups, in this case the, the mean in, um, in one group, um, so defines the difference from the mean in another group, so say a control group and an intervention group, and then divides that whole thing by the standard deviation. That's the thing that allows it to normalize, and so that um, so an effect size doesn't really have units, and or instead you can think of it as being in standard deviation units, and so that um, so an effect size of one means that your intervention has helped improve the um, the knowledge of the group by one full standard deviation. There are, I'm going to show you different flavors of effect size later, but, the, but it all boils down to this, is kind of the, the mean uh, of one group versus the mean in the other group in the raw scores, and then dividing it by the standard deviation so it's no longer expressed in terms of mean number of questions uh, that I got right. Out of, out of however many questions I had, but instead now it's expressed in terms of standard deviation units. Now, why is that a why is that a good thing? Um, here, this um, this this slide helps in terms of uh, in terms of giving us the 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 blow by blow as to why effect sizes are used. As I said, it allows apples to apples comparison. My randomized controlled trial of uh, of this computer tutorial um, in terms of increasing knowledge scores on oral rehydration solutions is um, is uh, can then be compared to your trial on it, where you used a different outcome. Um, it also has has more meaning. So there was uh, sort of an increase of a score from seven out of ten to eight out of ten. You know, sort of doesn't uh, isn't all that convincing. Whereas if I or it doesn't you can't really assess how convincing it is. Whereas if I tell you that I was able to bump up your learners by one standard deviation unit, that has uh, that has significance, and in particular it has educational significance. We're often sort of dealing with populations of learners, and, and, and educators often speak in terms of standard deviations and how far we are off of that, and in particular in terms of setting standards. Um, this technique is borrowed from meta-analysis, um, and so therefore, you know, sort of it's, uh, we've got our results already pre-packaged to allow us to, um, to combine educational trials in meta-analyses. And, um, and also, uh, I'll show you in a bit, is it gives you a sense of, you know, sort of for an individual, on average, if I do this thing, what will it mean to, to me? Like, how much will I improve? There are disadvantages, of course, and part of it is that, uh, that the, anytime you do math, anytime your outcome measure depends on math or a formula and the like, you lose some people. So that uh, so everybody has a universal experience of having scored seven out of ten on an exam, except uh, Mark Auerbach who always gets ten out of ten. But that's a separate thing. The, um, and so that uh, so people know what seven out of ten sort of vaguely means, whereas an effect size of zero point six isn't as commonly used. And um, and that's one of the points of this talk is to is to make it that, uh, that we can uh, we can get to the point where where an effect size is. Uh, give us uh, that we can truck in those in the same way. There are multiple versions of these and you know sort of each version has its own advantages and disadvantages but um, but the you know sort of a, those are all kind of a, a few percent differences that are that are important to you know, sort of a rarefied researchers and um, and I think that the, the take-home message from this talk will be that to use an effect size of some kind, You've gotten 90% of the benefit of um, of this idea, and then which one you choose is is kind of splitting hairs. And, um, so I may get shot for that, but the um, that's uh, that's my uh, emergency department uh, physician cut to the chase version of this. It can be difficult to do statistical testing on this, and I'm going to I'm going to touch on how we determine 95% confidence intervals. It's not so easy as a, as it is uh, for a t-test, but it but it can be done. So, so we'll talk about that as well. Um, I've, uh, I've embedded some URLs in this presentation, so when you download the presentation, you can have the URL. This is a good one where somebody devoted their life to talking about effect sizes on a, on a website, and so, that, um, so there's lots of useful information at this website. And, the, um, and uh, in addition, it's a, at these websites, you can get way, way deeper into um, 
to these ideas that, uh, that I'm going to present today. Okay, so I've done a I've done a study. Somebody meets the meets the inclusion criteria, gets randomized, and gets randomized to some intervention versus some control. And at the end of them, both people do a post test, and so that a uh, post test one versus a uh, post test two. And I want to compare how the uh, how the intervention group specifically does compared to the post test in order to decide whether my my intervention is an effective one and uh, and whether or not I should promote it to the world. So I did one of these trials, and, I, and this, is, um, this is a table from, uh, from that file where we randomized people to doing a computer tutorial after seeing a patient in the emergency department. And they could do this computer tutorial either immediately after having seen the, um, seen the patient, or they could, uh, they were, if they were randomized such, they had to do it a day later and so, that, um, so that we could see whether, whether just in time was way better than doing things on a delayed fashion. And so, so we had two different topics. We had a fever topic and we had an oral rehydration solutions topic. And, we, uh, and then at the end of the day, we looked at post-test scores and tried to see whether or not the post-test scores were, were increased. And here I've reported the raw score, just to, just to illustrate again, you know, so this is a raw score out of 10. And so on my test, if you get 6.2 out of 10, you know, so that's better than what they started out at, at 3.3. But again, it doesn't necessarily tell you what's, um, what's happening. But we do have standard deviation units to, to help us in terms of and so the, so the way we would calculate the effect size for this trial is take the mean of the intervention group, assuming that it's going to be bigger, and so then subtract the mean of the control group and divide it by the pooled standard deviation. And that would give us an effect size and give us a number that would uh, give us an idea of how that works. And, um, and so that uh, so when we do that in this trial, we found you know sort of uh, I haven't done the math completely here, but uh, but the effect size is essentially zero in this group, and then was 0.5 over two, which is 0.25 in this group. And so that um so that I can do that math in my head. It's not difficult. I've got a standard deviation. This the pooled standard deviation in uh, in this particular group is roughly two. I can see that the difference here is 0.5, so 0.5 over 2 is not very impressive, and so that, um, and that's borne out by the fact that there wasn't any statistically significant or a difference in that group. And, and you surely don't need to do math in my fever without source group, wherein the difference between the two was um, was very very small, and um, across a smaller standard deviation. So, but, um, so, uh, so, the, so my point in this is that it's math that I can do in my head and so I can generate an effect size really, really quite quickly, oops, get you to the formula, and come up with a number that, uh, that expresses how big the effect uh, was of my particular intervention. Now, the, now, going back to this uh, thing, you can see that it, say I wanted to calculate the effect size of going from the pretest to the post-test, well, here we've got something going, right? So that I had people do this pretest, and they scored on average around three out of uh, out of ten. And so that um, and so in doing the tutorial, they learned. They went from three and got six out of ten on the uh, on the post test. And so so to make the math easy, let's say that's an increase of three points across a standard deviation of one point five. It means three divided by one point five, which means an effect size of two. So that's a, that's a sizable one, and so that you can see that my tutorial worked going from the pretest to the post-test. But the difference between my intervention, my comparison groups of doing the tutorial immediately versus doing the tutorial in a delayed fashion, didn't really make much difference from one side to the other. Does that make sense to people? Any questions about about the way this this works before I go on to kind of set the number into um, into context? Studies show that I'm supposed to wait 17 seconds to see whether or not there's a question because at that point the social pressure of asking a question becomes so unbearable that somebody in the audience will ask a question. However, I think those studies were all done in, um, in lecture halls where there were actual bodies and actual shifting from side to side and awkward, not making eye contact and all that kind of thing. And I'm afraid we've lost that social dynamic here. So. But, uh, but by all means, uh, please interrupt with, uh, with questions, and, um, and I'll try and look across this console and uh, see that. 
So onwards, we've seen how to calculate an effect size. And this particular effect size, I told you that there were different flavors of them. So, that, uh, so this particular effect size is called the Cohen's D, after a very, very smart man named Jacob Cohen, who's, uh, who you may know from the sample size um, or power literature. He's the guy who basically defines uh, power calculations and how to do them. And in fact, if you look carefully at any power calculation, they invariably have some version of the effect size in there to, uh, to, to start you off. So in a, in a, the Cohen's D thing works well for comparing two, two groups, a post, uh, an intervention group and a control group. Um, there are also flavors of this that allow you to incorporate the pretest. So in that table I've shown you a pretest and so that, um, so that you can incorporate that to get an overall effect size. And so, that, uh, so the way that's done is with this funky formula down here in which you take the post-test minus the pretest for, for your treatment group and then subtract the post-test minus the pretest for your control group, and then put that all, all over some pooled estimate of your, um, of your pretest standard deviation. And, uh, and a lot of these formulas wonder about this denominator, and so that, um, so that they, they pool the standard deviation of the control group and think that's the right thing, whereas other people argue that you should pool the standard deviation across both your intervention group and your control group. And, uh, uh, on and on and on. In general, I don't find it makes a tremendous amount of difference. And, um, and just as long as you choose one, the standard one is this one up here with the Cohen's D, where you pull the standard deviation of both of those groups. Uh, and I think as long as you report what you did in some sort of appendix or some uh, in the method section and, and put, uh, put the actual formula in, or at least a reference for the formula, then, then you've done your bit for transparency and sure that, uh, that people can reproduce. There's another class of effect size, uh, which is called the proportion of variance explained. And so the, the reason I started off with the Cohen's D and the, um, and the reason it's my favorite is that it's one that makes sense to educators. And sort of a, I have increased your population's learning by one standard deviation. That makes, that makes sense to an educator and an educator is used to thinking about um, assessment in terms of standard deviation. With the proportion of variance explained, that's a researcher's effect size. And so that, that tells you how much of, uh, of the variance in the dependent variable is explained by your particular intervention as the independent variable. And so you can see that it's, uh, it's uh, in essence derived from the ANOVA table and so that the sum of squares of the effect is put over the total sum of squares to give you, uh, to give you this particular effect size. Now, there are trend, this, this line here that I've drawn in the middle is semi-permeable so that you can, uh, you can convert one to the other and so that, um, and so that mathematicians can, uh, can show that they're, uh, they're in essence equivalent and so that the same information is in one as is in the other and so and in essence it's a, it's a kind of packaging. Sometimes it comes down to who, what's, your favorite, um, what's your favorite statistical package and so that um, so that, uh, so that here, um, is SPSS reports the partial eta squared. The partial refers to the fact that there, there's an overall eta squared, where, wherein all of the um, sort, of, uh, sort of variance in the model that the model explains is, uh, is in that effect size. Whereas in this case, you know, sort of if, um, if, we're, if we're worried about this intervention called ST24QD2, whatever that is, um, then, uh, then the, the eta squared for that is 0.046. So that's not the p-value, that means that 5% of the variation in the dependent variable on this table is explained by this particular st 24 whatever. And so, there is. so again, here's the formula for the partial eta squared and the overall eta squared is up here. Um, so, uh, so again, you'll see this reported, and um, and again, it's an effect size, and it's just, uh, but it's uh, but it's kind of tied to the particular model that it's uh, that it's reported from, and not derived directly from the from the transparent conversion. Okay, so I've got an effect size. I've got a number. What's it mean? So, but, um, so the, that same Jacob Cohen, who first reported this, um, put some words 
to numbers, so that um, so that he uh, he said that uh, that an effect size of 0.2 was the minimum that's educationally significant, and then 0.3 is a small effect size, 0.5 moderate, moderate, and 0.8 large. And and Pete, you'll see these numbers all the time. And in fact, oftentimes you'll see in a in a in a paper where they've written, you know, sort of I report an effect size of 0.54, which is moderate um, according to the criteria established by Jacob, Jacob Cohen. So that um, so that uh, so these numbers have entered the vernacular in kind of the same way as we've decided that P is less than 0.05 is marvelous, whereas P is less than 0.051 is um, is uh, not publishable. But, uh, so these words have probably more power than they should, but, uh, but it's good for all of us to know. The, um, and so the, uh, another, another person or another way we can look at this context is to look at the, word, the work of a man by the name of John Hattie. He's an edu general education researcher in New Zealand. And uh, he's made his name from doing a phenomenal number of, um, of uh, meta-analyses looking at every possible education intervention. And, and in doing all of these meta-analyses, he's reported them all using effect sizes. And, um, and he ends up reporting, you know, sort of uh, the difference between changing the classroom size versus using iPads. And so that uh, and the effect size of one is this, and the effect size of the other is that. And so they're very much trying to make apples to apples comparisons when you're trying to compare a horse to a lizard. So it's kind of a problem, but it's a, but it, nonetheless it's interesting as a as an overall. Um, cataloging of, of what we're trying to do and how we're trying to improve education. So I highly recommend this book. It's called um, Visible Learning, and it's a synthesis of over 800 meta-analyses relating to education achievement. And I'll show you, and this is the cover of the book, and I'll show you the, um, the, main, uh, the main page from it in that he, he comes up with like a top 100 of things you can do in education rated by effect size according to the studies that have been published. And this is way less precise a sciences uh, than he makes it out to be, but um, but the but his list makes sense. You know, sort of uh, sort of the that feedback is the gold um, is the gold standard. So if I give feedback, the effect size is on average across a lot of studies 1.13, which means if I give effective feedback, I can move somebody along by a, a full standard uh, standard deviation. Um, the student's prior knowledge is um, is uh, is important, and, uh, and so on. So ratings of instructional quality, classroom environment, uh, peer tutoring, and even um, this computer aided instruction down here at kind of a 0 0.31, which is the uh, order of um, good effect size. And, um, and what he's uh, and what he did was he looked at um, he looked at all of these studies these 800 studies and then ranked them according to the effect size that the particular study reported and if the study didn't report an effect size he sort of looked at the looked at the the numbers and then cranked the math out himself so that he could get everything onto onto one scale and so uh, so again there are, you know sort of clearly limitations to trying to take 800 studies and put them on one particular x axis no matter how good you think the effect size is. But, um, but it's interesting, you know, sort of there are, um, all of these studies are normally distributed and uh, the mode of the uh, normal distribution of the mean, those being roughly the same, is a 0 0.4. So just above the, um, the, the cutoff that Cohen had, uh, had recommended as being, uh, being effective. And so that, uh, there's some outstanding things, and so feed the feedback studies tend to be up here, sort of uh, moving people along one full standard deviation and, uh, and higher. And so that these studies are all worth looking at. But in fact, you know, sort of we damaged some people, and so that uh, so people showed uh, showed more confusion at the end than, than they had at the start in some of these studies. And, uh, and this uh, this large step off probably between here and here is due to publication bias. And that, uh, as soon as you're at zero, then, uh, then we're less likely to less likely to share. 
And, um, and then he came up with this cheesy sort of speed gauge of, uh, of studies. And so that, um, so if, you're a, if you've got a negative effect size ain't so good, we put you in right and uh, in red, and that's, uh, that's bad. Somewhere around 0 0.1, if you, just, uh, if you just sit there and do no learning, you're going to improve just because you're getting older and you're myelinating more. And so that, uh, so this, is the, this is the effect size, if you will, of myelination. So, but, uh, so that's the that's the lowest common denominator. And then you add a teacher to the mix, and so that as soon as you add a teacher to the mix, they're gonna they're gonna do well absent uh, absent any specific intervention. And now, as we start to add interventions and specifically more and more tailored feedback, for example, we can crank around the dial and uh, bring you into a high effect size, where the zone, as, as Hattie has called it, the zone of desired. So, so you can see that it calls the hinge point an effect size of 0 0.4. So, so any study that you do is likely to be at the 0 0.4 level. That's average. And, um, and so, that, uh, so if you achieve effect sizes that are high, then, um, then, then you're going to be doing well. So, um, so here's a quote from Hattie. And, um, and I apologize if you can't read all of that. but. Uh, but if you download PowerPoint presentation, you should be able to. And on the next slide, I have the URL of where this is. Um, this has been quoted. But what I like about it, you know, sort of, he named his book "Visible Learning," and what he means by that is that um, is the idea that uh, that that if if I teach well, then somebody else looking at the product of my teaching, looking at the student six months later, should be able to feel that this person's smarter about the topic that I just did, that they're more comfortable, that they're more poised, that they, that they have deeper knowledge about the particular thing. And so that, uh, so that he felt that if you could feel or see or it was noticeable learning, that that was what we were all shooting for, and that we needed a metric and needed a sense of what that would, uh, what that would be. And so I'll read this, uh, this second paragraph here, where in which Cohen argued that an effect size of Cohen's D equals 1.0 should be regarded as a large, blatantly obvious, and grossly perceptible difference, such as the difference between a person at 5 foot 3 and one at 6 foot 0. This would be a difference that would be visible to the naked eye. So, so if you use this effect size formula on heights, and look at the standard deviation of, um, of people, people's heights, and then look at the difference between 5.3 and 6.0, then that 9-inch difference would be over a standard deviation of 9, which would give you a Cohen's effect size of 1. And so that that's the hope in using effect sizes, is that, that they can guide us to figure out exactly what that difference, uh, difference looks and feels like as opposed to my exam score went up by three points. Here's another way of thinking about it. Okay, so if, I, if, my, if my effect size uh, of the intervention is zero, that means that, uh, that the people who would, uh, the people in the control group who would be below the mean um, knowledge outcome of the people in their intervention group would be 50%. So that uh, so it'd be like two normal distributions that exactly overlap each other, and there's no separation, and so that 50% are on one side of the mean, and 50% are on the other side. Of the mean. As my effect size goes up, those two normal distributions shift, and so that the intervention side is getting is getting further and further, and so that the mean score in the intervention side would now uh, account for 62% of the people in the control group. And so, um, and so that too is another way. As as I go down, let's see what happens when I get close to close to one. Is that when I get out to there now, 82 per you're doing better. The average person in your intervention group is doing better than 82 percent of the people in the uh, in the control group. And um, and what's nice about this is that we're thinking now of populations. We're thinking about how we can move whole populations in terms of their knowledge and shifting them. And here's the um, here's the URL for the for that Hattie work that I was describing. Now, when we report the results, we report a point estimate. And as as good evidence based practice people, we don't want to just have uh, the point estimate. But we want to say we want a sense of how sure we are of that point estimate and what the range of plausible point estimates is. 
And we would typically do that with a 95% confidence interval around whatever it is. The problem with effect sizes is that the 95% confidence interval is devilishly difficult to calculate. It's not a formula like 1.96 times the square root of the standard error. So, but, um, so instead, to, to calculate the confidence interval, you have, to do, you have to use computers to do bootstrapping techniques wherein they guess and then they try it out and then they guess and they try it out and they do that over and over and over again. And it's based on something, not the normal distribution, but something called the non-central T. And, um, and the thing that, uh, and I barely understand this, so, that, um, so bear with me, but the, but the gist of it is, is that here's the, here's the distribution if you do this bootstrap technique. Say, say this, is the, this is the point estimate of the effect size, and it's um, sort of this number here, and these are sort of unrealistic numbers here, but this, uh, bear with me for this, uh, for this demonstration. Illustration, if you will. So, say this is our point estimate for the uh, for the 95% for the for the effect size. Then, when you go to calculate the lower bound of the of the 95% confidence interval, it's a different distribution compared to the upper bound. So that um, so that the computer has to use a different asymmetrical distribution, and that's where this non-central t comes in. And it has to, based on that asymmetrical distribution, come up with the estimates for the lower bound and the estimate for the upper bound. Okay. So, so this uh, has bedeviled a lot of people and, and probably impaired the likelihood that people are going to use effect sizes because we like the idea of having, a, having an idea of the variance. And that is one of the advantages of the raw scores. The raw score is a number, a number with, that's been determined by a t-test as far as how big the difference is between the intervention group and the control group. T-tests translate beautifully in the 95% confidence interval, so at least I have an idea of sort of, uh, sort of what the range is around my point estimate. So, the, um, so along came a guy named Jeff Cummings, and, um, and he's an Aussie. For some reason, all of this stuff happens, uh, happens down in the, um, down in the uh, lower half of the world. And so, that, um, so Jeff Cummings developed, uh, you know, published uh, several papers on the non-central T and the way you develop 95% um, confidence intervals. And uh, that wasn't uh, enough for us mere mortals. And so they went along and created a $15 Excel spreadsheet that allows you to calculate the 95% confidence interval around the point estimate. And the way this works is, is that you put the numbers of your control group, say, into, into one column down here, and the numbers for your intervention group up here, and, um, and, then, uh, and then hit uh, hit go. And what it will come up with is, uh, is this table in here. And so I've got 100 in my control group, 100 people in my intervention group. The mean, um, the mean score, if you will, sort of uh, was 0.54 in the control group and is higher in the intervention group. Um, these things each have standard deviations of around 0.12 and a, a conventional confidence interval around that of uh, such and such based on the, um, based on the T um, distribution. But, um, but as, we, as we move down, we get, uh, we get an estimate of D. And so, uh, so in this case, um, probably got the, got the sign reverse, but, uh, but just trust me on this one that the intervention gives a Cohen's D of 1, so a nice sizable, uh, sizable effect size. But it, um, it also comes down here and calculates the lower and the upper bound across that. So it could be as big as 1.5 and could be as small as 0 0.8. Um, still a sizable effect size, and so because the um, because the um, again I apologize for the signs being backwards on this, but um, but uh, but you get the idea that be 0.8 between 0.8 1.5, and therefore um, and therefore sort of even if it's the worst case scenario, my study was uh, was uh, sort of grossly optimistic, I'd still I'd still be confident that this intervention is effective. It's also represents it in nice graphic form. You know, sort of every single data point that's over here is a circle over here. And so for group one, you can see it across the uh, across the top here, and then group two is across the bottom. And I think, yeah, I think it's sort of fairly clear cut that this mean is different from this mean, and sort of that which gets represented down here graphically. This is a sense of uh, what's happening and expressed in terms of Cohen's D. 
Um, <clears throat> there's also a one, uh, a, a single group or differences type of thing, and so that you can uh, subtract the, if it's paired data, you can subtract the two and, uh, um, and get a 95% uh, or an effect, effect size based on the uh, based on the difference, and again get uh, get 95% intervals this time around. The difference as opposed to, as opposed to, um, as opposed to the So in, in summary, I've, I've argued that uh, that we in education research where we can is to report effect sizes. There are advantages to this in that it allows us to make apples to apples comparisons across studies and um, and, uh, and allows us to a uh, feel for what uh, what the size of the difference is between one compared to the other. So in that in that respect, we can assess the educational significance of our uh, our intervention same way as we hold clinical trials um, up to the standard of being able to, uh, of clinical significance, will it make a difference to my patient? Um, it uses the language of meta-analysis, and this is a good thing because then we, then we think across studies instead of sort of being limited as shackled within a single, uh, uh, single, within a single study. And then finally, um, sort of we can translate this into, a, into an interpretation of an effect for an individual. If I do this thing and its effect size is 0.5, that means on average I'm going to improve by a, a standard deviation. I've talked about these disadvantages, and I hope I've made it less opaque. You'll let me know. And um, and we and we alluded to the multiple versions, and I think that the main thing is to know that there are these proportion of variance explained types of effect sizes, and then the ones that are based on the standard deviation issue. As long as you know roughly that those are the two versions, then uh, then, then the rest of it's icing. And um, it can be difficult to do this statistical testing, and so that um, so that more besides that spreadsheet I've shown you, that, that there are more and more ways of doing this, but um, it remains sort of not as straightforward as it was. And then um, and finally, you know, sort of in terms of evidence-based practice in this framework, the um, the last part of it is can we apply the results? And uh, I'll leave that to, to you because this doesn't, uh, you know, as educational, this we think about context probably even more than the clinical people do. And I think that that's how I'm probably more straightforward. It's more straightforward to be able to think about it. I think so. Oftentimes, it's more difficult. Context and generalizing across context can be more. Good. So we talked about is it valid? We talked now about what are the results, and, and as I've mentioned, um, can you apply the evidence as the, uh, as the last step in that, in that process? So I hope that you will use this um, evidence-based uh, way of approaching uh, approaching the critical appraisal of education studies, and use it as well when you design your particular questions and about. So thanks a lot, and um, and again, I'd be happy to take questions.